um, put the title of management of mild HIE. I'm not 100% sure um, I'll get to the management of these babies. Maybe uh, what I'm going to be presenting to you over the next slides is that a lot of places are already doing therapeutic hypothermia for these babies. So uh, maybe the best title would be Therapeutic Hypothermia for Infants with Mild HIE. Is there a drift in this practice justifiable? So uh, I have nothing to disclose. We all know that therapeutic hypothermia does improve survival uh, and improve disability. So that comes from all the studies that you are familiar with in babies with moderate or severe neonatal encephalopathy. So following that study, you know, we know the UCOR statement that said that therapeutic hypothermia should be used consistent with the trial protocols. It's an effective therapy and the babies that go into TH should meet the trial entry criteria. Well, the trial entry criteria did not have mild HIE babies uh, into their studies. However, what we have seen is a big drift in practice. Uh, just so you know, the drift started with the last trials. So as you know, the Chinese trial in 2010 and Susan Jacobs' trial, uh, the ICE trial in 2011, already showed a few babies with mild HIE that got into the studies. 20% in the China trial and 19% in the Australian trial. And following that, there's a lot of data from registries, the Vermont Oxford Network, um, the Children's Hospital Database in Michigan, the California Network, and the Japanese Network. And as you can see here on, the, on that side, it goes from 15% of babies uh, that receive hypothermia being mild encephalopathy up to 40%, depending on what registry you're looking at. And there is some single centers report published between 15 and 17 in many different countries. And as you can see again, it's between 20 to 54% of babies that are submitted to hypothermia in their center are babies with mild encephalopathy. And if you look at that number, how many babies with mild encephalopathy that got to the center that end up being treated with hypothermia, in some centers is all of them like Boston, where Dr. Inder works, 100% of babies with mild neonatal encephalopathy are cooled, and they do represent half, a little bit over half of the cooled population. So if you put all together, mild encephalopathy represents 15, up to 54% of all babies that are cooled. And of the babies with mild any uh, 55 percent to 100 percent of, percent of them are being cooled in those places. A recent uh, survey was done in UK by Sudden. Uh, so they surveyed 48 units in the UK and one of the questions, and that survey was specifically about mild HIE, um, is your unit offering cooling for babies with mild HIE? And 75% of the NICUs in UK are cooling babies with mild HIE. And when they ask why, as you can see here, the first reason is that mild HIE may progress to moderate, missing the window of opportunity. The second reason, because it's very difficult to grade HIE soon after birth. Uh, and the other one is, is a risk of long-term adverse neurological outcomes. You know, I was quite surprised that people were answering that because as I'm going to show you, the evidence is not so, so clear out there. And when they ask why your unit is not offering mild HIE, um, the ones that decided not to do 100% said because there's no evidence to support cooling in infants with mild HIE. And half of them said that the vast majority do well uh, and do not get any neurological deficit. So we decided to do a survey in Brazil. You know, I come from Brazil, as uh, Subesh said. Uh, so we sent a questionnaire to uh, a lot of professionals working in NICUs there. We got 1,092 replies. And we had 19 questions there. But 
three questions were related to myod. So we asked if they're using myod, uh, hypothermia for myod HIE. If not, why? If yes, why? So this is what the Brazilians are doing. It's not 75% like in the UK, but you still have almost 40% of babies uh, with mild HIE that are getting cooled in Brazil. And I have to tell you, this is a lot of concern for me because they have problems in the way they apply hypothermia. And we ask, when we ask them why, the reasons are pretty much the same. Uh, they're worried that the level will change over time, will progress over time. Uh, they were worried about it's difficult to classify these kids in the first six hours of life uh, and they may develop some brain injury. So, is it justifiable? Well, first of all, what is mild HIE? And the more we dig into that subject, the more doubt I have and the more difficult I have on how we're going to classify these babies in mild encephalopathy and what are the outcomes of these babies. So now I have to go back a little bit in the history of a, uh, neonatal encephalopathy for you to understand um, where we came from, where we are, and what, where we might head. So as you know, the first neonatal encephalopathy staging system was developed by Sarnat and his wife uh, in, uh, in Canada. And that was published in 1976. Uh, that study enrolled 21 babies. And for the first time, they clearly uh, developed three stages. Stage one being mild, two moderate, and three severe encephalopathy. Well, the first thing that's different is that the definition of perinatal asphyxia was quite loose. Uh, presence of fetal distress, or an APGA score less than five at one, or five minutes. That's not what we use today. So they also showed that all babies, there was, um, they were classified as a stage one in the first 24 hours of life. They all moved into a stage two of moderate. So if the first reason why people are cooling babies with mild HIE today is because they worried they might progress. In the first paper by Sanat, they all progressed from one to two. Nevertheless, all the outcomes were normal. So you might say here, well, but this is less severely babies that we deal today because the criteria to define perinatal asphyxia was much more loose. And I would agree with you, that's absolutely right. So encephalopathy scores since then have been used uh, to predict neurodevelopmental outcomes uh, since the Sarnat. So what we knew before the hypothermia studies about babies with mild HIE well, there are some studies that have been published before the trials. Uh, some babies with mild encephalopathy were enrolled there. As you can see, all of them have been classified based on neurological exam, but not so early in life. You know, they were like, uh, the classification was the worst level within the first week of life. And now we have to do this classification in the first hours of life if we're going to move into hypothermia or not. And the outcomes were all normal. Normal or in the one study was my, some kids had mild uh, uh, abnormalities. So if you move forward, you know, from 1995 to 2006, had another four studies here. Now the classification was much earlier in the first six hours of life. And based in a mix of neurological exam and early EEG, and these outcomes were looked at two years, two years and a half. And again, the vast majority of them were normal. So in one study here, you had one baby with a moderate abnormality. And in the Shani study in 2006, had two babies with abnormalities. So if you put it all together, and we did, uh, we had 195 babies with mild HIE, three with abnormalities. So if you look at that, Incidence of abnormalities in all babies with mild HIE is 1.5%. But if you look in the ones that were classified as mild in the first six hours of life, the incidence of abnormalities was 4%. That's what we knew before the hypothermia trials. So the incidence of abnormalities in this population is very, very small. And they also had some data on long-term outcomes of these babies. Some babies looked at three years and a half, five, 
eight to 10 years of age. And if you, again, put all of them together, you see that the reports show that they all did very well. They were normal, or some of them with mild delay being classified as a delay that's not affecting their daily functions. So the most recent data that came from that pre-hypothermia era was a retrospective analysis done by um, Murray in Ireland, in Cork, and was published in Pediatrics a few years ago. So basically they looked into a neonatal encephalopathy cohort from 2003 to 2005, and they had a cohort of control patients that were two years uh, later, so from 2005 to 2007. And they had, in these babies, they had early EEG, not AEG, it's a full channel EEG. And they classified as mild encephalopathy and EEG equal grade one. And that was basically normal or mild abnormalities on the EEG. So they did not do the Sarnet score in the first six hours of life. The Sarnet score was signed the worst score in the first 24 hours of life. And because this is an old cohort, they had some cognitive and moral outcomes at five years of age in some of them. So 47 out of 65 infants with mild encephalopathy, or with neonatal encephalopathy, sorry, uh, 22 with mild, and they had the outcomes of 71% of historical control. So what they found is that the babies that they classified retrospectively as being mild NE at six hours of life had lower full-scale IQ, verbal IQ, and performance IQ when compared to controls. I got to have to say that when you look at the controls values, they're very high. And when you look at the mild NE values, are in the normal range. So they are lower to very high levels. So the intact survival in DASH studies was 97% in the control, 75% in the mild encephalopathy and 46% in the moderate. So in summary, in the pre-hypothermia studies, uh, they have used different definitions of perinatal asphyxia, different definitions of neonatal, mild in neonatal encephalopathy, and different time points for assessment of encephalopathy, and different time points for assessment of outcomes. So that made it difficult to know the precise outcomes of mild encephalopathy in the new era of therapeutic hypothermia. Because now babies are treated with that, uh, they have significant acidemia and or need of resuscitation at birth, and we need to classify the encephalopathy in the first six hours of life. So let's take a look into the hypothermia trials, uh, because these are the most, the first babies that uh, came with mild encephalopathy and were cooled. So it had, uh, as I mentioned to you, had the Chinese trial and the ICE trial. So in the Chinese trial, uh, 39 out of a total of 194 babies that were enrolled in the study, which is 20%, they had mild encephalopathy. If you read the paper, there is no definition of what is mild encephalopathy. So 21 of them got head cooling, 19 were in the control group. And when they look into both groups, there were no difference in death or major disability between mild HIV babies that were cooled and controls. The ICE trial was the second one that enrolled a few babies with mild encephalopathy. Again, if you read the paper published in JAMA PEDS, there was no definition provided for what is mild HIE. 25% were in the cooling group and 38% in the control group. And of course, those numbers are very small and there is no difference in the outcomes of these patients. So somebody decided to do a systematic review. Folks from Perth, Australia, they recently, recently published in Journal of Child Neurology. They decided to look into mild HIE babies that were cooled. So how many of them are cool? What are people doing out there? So they end up on 13 uh, studies uh, included in the quantitative meta-analysis. These 13 studies are observational studies. 
for a total of 2,783 babies. And nearly 22% of the babies who received hypothermia in those studies had only mild HIE, with a 95% confidence interval going from 16% to 27%. So here are all the studies together. As you can see on the right side here, the criteria used to diagnose this mild HIE is quite variable and not entirely clear. And the proportion of babies with mild HIE that gets cooled is very variable. There's a huge heterogeneity if you look at all the studies. There's one here, for example, this is the Boston Center I told you that 54% of the babies cooled a mild HIE. But in generally, it's about 20%, 25% of babies being cooled in your unit will be with mild encephalopathy if you decided to cool them. So again, the meta-analysis found that 22% of the babies that underwent, underwent therapeutic hypothermia had only mild, a significant heterogeneity, and this is not surprising, that's what they wrote, given that the evidence about the beneficial effects of hypothermia in mild HIE is not established. So the evidence is not established, but we are doing it. And, um, and people were doing that more and more. So this is the only data, or the best data we have in the post-hypothermia hypothermia era. And that comes from Dallas, where Lena Shalak, who was a collaborator with us in the prime study, uh, did a study with Tara Dupont. Uh, and as you know, Parkland has a lot of deliveries. So they look at the 46,000 babies, out of which 144 had perinatal acidemia. 29 were normal and 60 were classified as mild encephalopathy. They do provide a definition. They define as mild NE when babies had one or two abnormal categories in the Sarnat score. So mild encephalopathy happened uh, in 12 out of, out of these, sorry, 12 out of the 60 babies with mild encephalopathy had abnormal short-term outcomes. And those are the outcomes they listed, and that's a retrospective study. So the babies that end up getting into their unit because of perinatal acidemia, classified as mild, and they looked at what happened with these babies. And eight of them had some feeding difficulties. Seven of them had abnormal neurological examination at discharge. Six had abnormal brain MRI. Five of them had seizures. One need gastrostomy, and one baby died baby classified as mild NE. So it's a 20%. So, and a few other studies have been published since then, and single center retrospective studies, one coming from my center at McGill, showing that some of these babies with mild encephalopathy in the first six hours of life, in the presence of significant perinatal acidemia or asphyxia, uh, do have some problems uh, on the go. So in the hypothermia era, infants with mild encephalopathy did have acidosis or resuscitation and were diagnosed in the first six hours of life. Abnormalities in the neuroimaging or discharge examination raise the possibility that brain injury may occur in this population. However, the precise frequency and magnitude of the injury remains unclear because of methodological limitations. So most importantly, follow-up of these babies with mild encephalopathy who were cooled uh, is not available and it's limited. So that's why we designed a few years ago the prospective research in infants with mild encephalopathy, the prime study that Subash uh, alluded at the, in the introduction. So the primary outcome of the study was published in 2017 uh, and the long-term outcome was published afterwards. And I'm gonna go through the study with you now. So this, is, this was a multi-center study. We enrolled uh, babies from six different centers uh, at McGill in Montreal, at Brown University, and Wayne State, and Dallas in the US, in London, UK, and in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, because one of the fellows that started the project at McGill with me she moved back to Bangkok, got a position there, and got the center into the study. So the objective of PRIME 
was to prospectively determine the frequency of abnormalities in infants with mild encephalopathy diagnosed in the first six hours of age. So babies were included in prime if they got admitted into the NICU. So first of all, if there was a baby born in somewhere with evidence of perinatal asphyxia and not referred and admitted to the NICU, we didn't know. So that was one of the limitations of the study. The birth weight was more than equal 1800, gestational age more than equal 36. We basically used the same criteria of most of the trials. And we have this latter approach where first one, step one, uh, there has to be an evidence of a hypoxic ischemic insult, and second one, a neurological evaluation. So the evidence of uh, hypoxic ischemic insult could be either a significant fetal acidemia, a pH less than equal seven, or base deficit that it's really n negative, more than 16, baby would immediately qualify for a neurological exam. If you had a core pH and a base deficit that was equivocal, so he would qualify for an exam if there was a sentinel event, for example, a core prolapse or a placental abrupture, and either had a low APGAR score at 10 minutes or a need for ventilatory support at birth and for 10 minutes. So basically we use the same criteria of the NICHG cooling trial. If there was no cord blood, cord, uh, blood gas available or blood gas in the first hour of life, we use that one here. So those are the three situations that these babies would qualify to go to the NICU, get a neurological exam, and then be classified. The neurological exam was standardized. Every single investigator in every single center got the formal training from the NICHD, from Dr. Leptuk and Dr. Shankaran, and we had to be certified to do the exam. And was performed in the first six hours of life, in the first 24 hours, uh, about 24 hours of age, and as close as possible to NICU discharge or transfer, whichever came first. So we decided there was no clear definition of what was mild encephalopathy. So we decided by using the modified Sarnat score that any baby that had no evidence of moderate or severe encephalopathy, because those ones would be cooled and was not completely normal, would be a mild encephalopathy. So if he scored zero, 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 and it was completely normal, he was a normal baby. If he had moderate or severe, he would be cooled. If he was in between that, had any abnormality, he would be a mild. And these babies were not treated with therapeutic hypothermia. The primary outcome of this study was any abnormality on any of the following. So any abnormality on AEEG, which we did in the first nine hours of age, brain MRI in the first month, or neurological examination at discharge and or transfer. And that was chosen because it was demonstrated by the NICHD trial a good correlation between the neurological examination at discharge and neurodevelopmental outcomes. So based on Tara Dupont data, we hypothesized that 20 percent of these babies who have some abnormality in any of the three components of the primary outcome. So the AEG was recorded um, with a minimum duration of one hour to have some good interpretation. And the tracings were de-identified and the analysis was performed by two independent investigators blinded to the clinical outcomes of these patients. And this is the classification. We use Dr. Hellstrom classification, uh, continuous normal voltage, discontinuous normal voltage, burst suppression, continuous low voltage, or flat tracing. The brain MRI was done in the first 30 days of age and without sedation. Again, the MRI studies were scored by an in independent and experienced NICHG pediatric neuroradiologist who was blinded to the clinical outcomes of these babies and use the NICHD classification that goes from zero to three, uh, three being cerebral hemispheric devastation, uh, 1A and 1B uh, are cerebral lesions, uh, and 2A and 2B have involvement of the basal ganglia area. The neurological exam at discharge was a combination of the modified Sarnet score plus an extended exam. So in that extended exam, we look also to the gag reflex, to the clonus, to the fisted hand, 
abnormal movement and the persistent asymmetric tonic neck reflex. So an abnormal neurological examinative discharge is any abnormal category here in the modified or any abnormality into the extended exam. We had a lot of secondary outcomes that we decided to look at the percentage of babies with each of the primary outcome measures, the progression or persistence of abnormal neurological exam during hospitalization, uh, if these babies seized, uh, how long they stay in the hospital, if they need gavage and some other things. And we decided to follow up them uh, to 18 to 22 months of age. So the long-term or short-term uh, follow-up of these patients was not the primary outcome of the study, it was the secondary outcome of the study. So we, uh, we calculated the sample size we needed. We needed 50 babies for this 20% expected rate of abnormalities using a coefficient interval for precision of 10%. So we decided to get a little bit more patients um, because we anticipated on the inability to acquire all three components of the primary and loss for follow-up. Uh, and a p-value of less than 0 0.05 was uh, considered statistically significant. So the results, so these are the babies here, the flow chart. So from 356 eligible for evaluation, we end up with 76 eligible for the study uh, and 63 of them enrolled, which was pretty good. And the reasons why these babies uh, do not were not eligible is because the vast majority was moderate or severe HIE, so they end up on cooling, and 25% were absolutely normal. So that gives you an idea of all babies referred to your center for possible cooling, one quarter, one quarter 25% will end up being classified as mild, which goes along exactly what people are doing for hypothermia in these patients. So 50% were moms that were uh, uh, gravida for the first time, they had college education. So here are the characteristics, the antenatal characteristics. 76% had abnormal fetal heart rate. Uh, as you can see, almost a 50% C-section and a 20% vaginal delivery with some instrumentation. So there was some problem going on in these patients. They needed resuscitation. 90% of them um, required PPV. <coughs> Uh, almost half got intubated, 15% need chest compression, and 67% need assistive ventilation at 10 minutes of life. So these are not totally well babies. They're babies that really got into some difficulty at birth uh, and require some resuscitation. Nevertheless, the APGAR scores were median of 5 and 7, and the core pH 6.99 with CO2 and the 7, 75 and a base deficit of 14. So this is the standard score of them at admission. As you can see, each category here on the left side, and whether the category was normal, mild, moderately affected, or severely affected. And most of these kids, they had the category scored as mild uh, for the level of consciousness, spontaneous activity, posture, tone and primitive reflexes as well as ANS. I put in red here the tone and the primitive reflexes. Those are the two categories that most of the time were abnormal in these babies on admission. So the primary outcome and the components of the primary outcome. So we end up with 54 babies where all the primary outcomes were there. So as I mentioned to you, the primary outcome was an abnormal AEG or an abnormal MRI or an abnormal neurological exam at discharge, and 52% of them had it. So what about the components of the primary outcome? So four babies had abnormal AEG, nine babies had an abnormal brain MRI, and 22 babies had an abnormal neurologic exam at discharge. So if you sum the numbers here, they don't get to 28 because some had both. So the majority of the abnormal primary outcome comes from abnormal neurologic exam at discharge. And there's a few combinations here. Only one baby had all three components abnormal. So let's go and see them. What was an abnormal early AEG? So AEG recordings were done in a median age of 5.5 hours, so within the window. 
We got 100% concordance between the readers. They didn't know each other. It was very interesting. But mostly because most of the AG were completely normal. So no baby had seizure in that first AEG done in the first hours of life. We had four babies with discontinuous normal voltage, which is 70%. Of these four babies with DNV, one had normal MRI and normal discharge exam. Two had moderate abnormal tone at discharge, and that was all. And one of them uh, is the baby that had all three, had a DNV, and had an MRI classified as 1B. What about the brain MRI? It was done at a median age of 13 days, and an abnormal MRI was noted in nine babies, so that's a 17%. And this is what we had. The majority of the brain, ab uh, brain MRI abnormalities were in the category 1. 1A or 1B, you had two babies with a 2B. And this is what happened with these babies. Their neurological exam at admission, the early AEG, all normal, except for those, that one baby. And the neurologic exam at discharge, the 1A, all normal. The 1B below, there's some abnormality on the neurologic exam at discharge. So the abnormal neurological exam at discharge was either a abnormal Sarnet score only, or an abnormal extended exam only, or both. And it was basically, like I mentioned to you, a mild abnormality on primitive reflexes, or a mild to moderate tone at discharge. So seven babies with this extended neurological exam that was abnormal had normal Sarnet score. And the abnormality in the extended were abnormal movements, fisted hand, or an asymmetric tonic neck reflex. So we we're more concerned about those findings. So nine babies with an abnormal MRI, out of which one had also an abnormal AEG, and two an abnormal tone at discharge. We had two babies with a moderate abnormal tone at discharge, one of which had the DNV on uh, AEG, and we had one baby with the discontinuous normal voltage. So this is 12 out of 54. That's a 20%, which goes along with Tara Dupont observation, 20% abnormality. So when we look at the secondary outcomes in the prime study, uh, one infant progressed to, uh, to moderate at 36 hours of age because this baby seized, and he seized at 36 hours of age. So this baby had an early AEG that was normal, but he had a, normal, a neurologic exam at discharge that was abnormal and a brain MRI that was a 2B. The median length was five days. So if you decided to cool babies with mild HIE, this is how long they stay, five days. With 40 infants, 74% of them stay more than three days, and these babies were not cooled. There were no deaths. And no infant was discharged home with gavage or gastrostomy, which was different from Tara Dupont, who had one death and a few babies on, on gavage or gastrostomy feeding. So the follow-up has ended, uh, and now it's finalized. And I'm going to show you. So on admission, the Sarnet score of these babies, we had some categories that were associated with the primary outcome. So the level of consciousness equal one was associated with abnormal primary outcome. And an abnormal tone and admission, uh, and also an abnormal autonomic nervous system and admission was also associated with the primary outcome. However, I have to say that we had abnormal primary outcomes in 38% of the babies with normal LLC, in 18% of babies with normal tone, and in 37% of babies with normal ANS. So not a good predictor. So in conclusion, of the first stage of the prime study, a large proportion of mild encephalopathy babies showed abnormality on short-term outcomes. But the prognostic significance of these findings is unknown, and we needed to follow them. Some of those abnormalities on neurologic exam at discharge and brain MRI equal 2B have been associated with childhood disability uh, in a small 
proportion of the population. So we followed them until 18 to 22 months. And of course, of those 63 babies and the 54 that had the primary outcome, we complete follow-up in 43% of them, but we're able to do a partial follow-up in eight, so in a total of 51%. So the partial follow-up means that these kids, these eight babies, you have no Bailey three. Uh, and we had some telephone interview of them. So I'm gonna present the data on the 43 that we did the Bailey three exam. So the first thing that we noticed is that when we look at the Sarnat score on admission, and those are the categories here, the level of consciousness, spontaneous activity, posture, tone, primitive reflex, and ANS, and the final score. And you can see that those figures are different. And these are babies that end up not having any disability at 18 to 22 months, and babies that end up with disability. So there's a difference in their neurological exam on admission and the evolution of the neurological exam during hospital stay. So how many of them had any disability? Well, we categorize any disability as mild, moderate, or severe. Use the same categorization that the NICHG used for their trial. So mild was a cognitive of 70 to 84 alone, or a cognitive more than equal 85 plus the GMFCS level one or two or seizures, or hearing deficit with ability to follow commands without amplification. A moderate disability was a cognitive score between 70 and 84, plus a GMF CS level of two, active seizure disorder, receiving anti-epileptic medication, or hearing deficit with the ability to follow commands after amplification. And a severe disability was a cognitive score less than 70, a GMF CF three to five blindness or hearing impairment with inability to follow commands in spite of amplification. So this was just published in pediatric research this year. And that's basically what we found. We found seven babies we, out of the 43 with disability between 18 to 22 months. And when you look at the total number of abnormal categories of those babies on admission, uh, you know the Sarnet score has six categories. So majority of these babies had four, 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 and six categories. There's two babies here that are only two or three abnormal categories, but as you can see, they had disability, scored as a severe disability because they were classified as autistic patients. And because they are autistic, they score very low in all these, the, the components of the Bailey score. There was only one baby that had four abnormal categories and a CP uh, uh, at 18 to uh, uh, 22 months. Disability is scored as a severe disability. So the final result was disability was detected in seven, which is 16% of this population. Four of these seven babies had mild disability and three had severe disability, out of which two were classified as severe because they were autistic patients. So 16% of babies with mild HIE diagnosed in the first six hours of age had disability. The Bailey score, less than 85, you can see that on the paper, was observed in 40% of the cohort, but this Bailey score, less than 85, in 40% of the babies were mostly because of language issue. And language is not the best time to be evaluated, 18 to 22 months. And a large percentage of this cohort came from Montreal families that are French speakers. And it was a bit more difficult to evaluate the language. Um, so we concluded that larger multi-center trials would be required to test whether abnormal neurodevelopmental outcome can be mitigated by neuroprotective strategies in mild HIE babies. So what we think is that the prime, prospective, contemporary, uncooled cohort provides important data that people need for the planning of their trials. And those trials should include a very large population and long-term evaluations up to six to seven years of age because you may not see CP, but you may see cognitive problems in these patients.
So there's a, uh, a retrospective analysis that was just published in American Journal of Perinatology. It's a single center, small study from St. Louis Children's Hospital here in the US. Uh, they looked back in their data from 2007 to 2014. And you see the problem comes again. Mild encephalopathy was, cla was classified as the worst grade of encephalopathy within the first week of life. So that's the old Sarnet score. Um, so the baby's uh, uh, encephalopathy was graded as mild if the baby was hyper alert. So that's only one category they took into account. They had some controls from a local cohort of healthy infants. So they matched that controls with their mild definition. Um, so they show that 15.4% of the neonates were treated with therapeutic hypothermia. They had mild encephalopathy. Uh, they noted more than 40% had some injury on MRI. The authors say very mild abnormality in most of the MRIs. Uh, and they concluded, because they looked into the Bailey scores uh, at 18 to 22 months, that the mild HIE babies and the healthy controls had the same neurodevelopmental follow-up across all domains of the Bailey score. So they said, well, it's good to cool them because all of them were cooled. Uh, so they said um, similar results, uh, they had similar results to the studies done in the pre-hypothermia area. So the question here is, did these mild HIE babies have the same neurodevelopmental outcome of health controls because of cooling? Or because they would have it anyway? Because they cool all of them. So is therapeutic hypothermia beneficial for mild encephalopathy? That's a big question. So this is a, uh, after the first PAS, when we talk about prime study, the panel decided to get together and uh, there's an issue on early human development. It was just about that, mild HIE. Uh, one group from uh, Terry Inder did a systematic review uh, and that systematic review ended up on four studies that were included in the meta-analysis and the, this is, a meta-analysis to find out if cooling mild HIE babies was beneficial or not. So this is what they found. Um, there was a small number of patients. So this is hypothermia, 45, control, 46, and wide interval and no difference whatsoever. So small numbers, uh, we don't know, and the data that we have available there's no difference on the outcomes of these patients. So can we make recommendations about management of babies with mild HIE? So the PAS did another symposium on the following year. And this next symposium, which was in Toronto uh, last year, was a satellite symposium, which was organized by Mohammed el Jeeb from Boston, Dr. Inder, and had many other investigators like uh, Alistair Gunn, Marianne Torreson, Lena Shalek, and Anne Massaro from Chicago. So this is, and they just published from DC, sorry. So um, they just published in Pediatric Research, I think a month ago or this month. So, um, and if you read the paper, the title is Should Therapeutic Hypothermia Be Offered to Babies with Mild Encephalopathy in the First Six Hours of Life? So there's some evidence that I show you that mild encephalopathy is associated with worse neurodevelopmental outcomes from contemporary studies of babies that were not treated with hypothermia. And there's a clear therapeutic creep in the use of hypothermia for these babies. The first thing that they, one of the things that they say in the, in the, in the special article is that the definition of mild encephalopathy is still controversial. And the ability to differentiate infants at a higher risk of disability from those who are truly mild affected is poor. And we need more research to improve our tools uh, in that sense. One could be a revised neurological examination. So we did went back into the prime study after that meeting and we decided to do 
some um, evaluation of the Sahanat score in the first six hours of life to see if that could discriminate the babies and the higher babies with mild HIE under the higher risk of impairment. So Lena and I went back with the help of Beverly, a biostatistician from uh, Dallas. And again, we looked back into the 43 babies where we had complete follow-up. Well, this is what we, we saw first. There was a difference uh, into the percentage of babies with abnormal exam for each of the categories that did, not develop, that did develop disability or did not develop disability. As you can see, for example, in the ANS here, we have much more babies with abnormal ANS compared to the ones did not develop disability. And this paper is under review in JPEDS now. So we develop what we call the total Sarnat score. It's basically you get the Sarnat score in the way you have it now. And for this is an example here. This child had a level of consciousness as one, spontaneous activity and posture as zero. The tone score as a 2A. The suck was weak. The motor was incomplete, and ANS was completely normal. So for the first category, one, zero, zero. For tone, two. For primitive reflexes, two. You just get one value. You don't have two and two, because that's only one category. And for ANS, zero. So the total Sarnet score was five in this baby. So we look into the ability of the total Sarnet score to discriminate between babies that will end up having disability or not. So as you can see here on the left panel, this is the scatter plot of the total Sarnat score for babies with disability and no disability. When the score was above five, basically a score above five captured everyone that had disability at the expense of some who did not. But we eliminated a lot of babies that do not develop disability. Babies with probably a more mild encephalopathy than the ones with a score above five. And this is the ROC curve uh, of this with an area under the curve of 0 0.78. So the sensitivity and the specificity were calculated for each of the categories and for the total Sarnat score. And as you can see here, the best is the total, which is not surprising. Uh, with a one of sensitivity, 100% sensitivity, and that's the confidence interval, and a 60% specificity. So if you use the total Sarnat score of four or more, or more to cool your babies with mild encephalopathy, you may cool some babies that don't need, but for sure you're not going to miss anybody that develop disability. And you're going to decrease, instead of cooling 25% of these kids, you may go down and cool 12% of these kids. So the total Sarnat score more than equal five, when performed, and it was performed in the first six hours of age, had a good accuracy to predict the burden of encephalopathy we wrote beyond the tip of the iceberg. So um, the score needs validation, however. That was a, a 43 babies only. Uh, but such approach could facilitate the planning of future trials. Instead of getting everybody that's not normal or quali qualify as a cooling, you target your trial uh, of neuroprotection and optimize the numbers needed to treat in the mild encephalopathy population. So is hypothermia beneficial for babies with mild encephalopathy? Well, one thing we have to keep in mind is that before offering cooling in this population, there are social, economic, and emotional costs related to maternal infant separation for the duration of cooling or longer, as well as side effects of hypothermia, which are important considerations that we need to have. Uh, possible problems is separation from the mother, delay in the initiation of feeds and or breastfeeding, stress related to the exposure to hypothermia, excessive monitoring and or invasive lines in these babies, shivering, plus or minus use of morphine. As a matter of fact, in the UK survey of mild HIE, 90% of the babies received morphine during the cooling. Other possible side effects have been uh, put together in the table of that meta-analysis. And as I, I summarized to you here, 
32% had extreme hypothermia, they overshoot it. Uh, 6 to 22% pulmonary hypertension, 8 to 41% thrombocytopenia, 11% hyperglycemia due to stress, and 13 up to 100% can have significant bradycardia. So we need to keep that in mind on the possible side effects of exposing these babies to uh, hypothermia. So formal trials of neuroprotection in babies with mild encephalopathy are now I think essential to confirm the risk benefit ratio before we just go into that like some centers have done. So they put together a framework for a possible RCT. As I was mentioning to Subash uh, and to Sri and Subash today, uh, this is, uh, as far as I know, there is one trial under planning in California, because California they had a lot of HIE and cooling and a very well organized uh, transport system. There's one trial on mild HIE being planned in the UK uh, and Dr. Shankara has one mild HIE trial that I know she is applying uh, to some sort of grant. So there's three possible trials um, ready to be initiated or looking for financial support uh, in therapeutic hypothermia in babies with mild HIE. So the framework is basically using the same criteria that we use in the prime trial for evidence of a hypoxic ischemic insult. I particularly disagree. They say that mild should be defined as one or more abnormality. As I show you, no baby with one abnormality had a, a disability, only one. So at least two or more abnormalities, or I would say a total SARNET score more than five. Uh, the intervention should be standard of care or hypothermia for three days. And the reason why they highlighted that is that there's some centers in the survey, the UK survey and in the Brazilian survey, saying that they cool these babies for 24 hours only or for 48 hours, or if the baby gets better, they stop. So it's being really all over the place. The primary outcome should be the Bailey 3, and here the secondary outcomes, and they've calculated the steady sample size end up with 365 infants that they need, which is higher than the Toby trial, which was the biggest hypothermia trial. So what do we do in the meantime? What should we do there? So this is what we can do. If you have a mild HIE baby coming, you do not cool, and you wait for the studies of efficacy and safety. Basically, you wait for the RCGs to see if the benefits are the same as observed for moderate or severe cephalopathy or even bigger, to quantify the magnitude of the effect, the cost benefit of doing cooling in these babies, and to define the safety profile side effects that I highlighted to you. Second possibility, you do not cool, but then you start hypothermia in infants where the level changes during the first 24 hours of life. So basically, you do late hypothermia. And that's basically what we decided to do at our center. So we don't cool them if they're mild. But if between 6 and 24 hours of life, they become moderate, we know there is some beneficial effect of late hypothermia. So we do cool them. Or you cool them. Uh, you offer hypothermia to mild encephalopathy babies, and you follow them closely and systematically, all of them, and you please include a long-term follow-up of them uh, in these babies. I think any of the three possibilities are reasonable with the data that we have in our hands now. Thank you.